is Virginia Hall, and I'm here to introduce to you Roger Rule, author of The Rifleman's Rifle and host of this series episode of Special Guns with Roger Rule. Thank you, Virginia, and welcome, and welcome viewers to my 13th episode of Special Guns with Roger Rule. What do we have to do today? Uh, in the last few episodes, we have been featuring mostly shotguns. Today, I have a real treat for rifle aficionados. This is a Holland & Holland Model Deluxe Mauser bolt action in 375 H&H Magnum. Is this a new rifle? No, this is uh, what Holland & Holland calls a pre-owned bespoke gun. It was built for a customer in uh, 1970. But as you can see, it shows little or no wear for all practical purposes. It's basically a new gun. Holland Holland is one of the premier gun makers uh, in the world. From S.P. Fistad's book, uh, Blue Gun of Gun Values, I want to quote uh, a section about Holland and Holland. Holland and Holland, over the years, has justly earned the reputation of producing some of the finest firearms ever manufactured, exhibiting outstanding quality and superior craftsmanship. Most of these fine arms are made to order for the famous, wealthy, or royalty of the day. Close quote. That quote, in a nutshell, describes Holland & Holland. Their uh, enduring reputation, uh, because of the integrity of their long-standing craftsmanship, commands very high prices. Are they still in business? Yes, uh, very much so. Their London-based company... Uh, has its roots going back to 1835 when Harris Holland set up his gunmaking business at, at uh, 9 King Street, Holborn. Right from the beginning, the firm Harris Holland founded soon developed uh, a worldwide reputation for both fine sporting shotguns and for rifles. Used in uh, the rifles were used in pursuit of big and dangerous game. In 1860, Harris Holland's nephew Henry Holland became a bound apprentice to his uncle, and the business moved to 98 New Bond Street, London, in the fashionable district of Mayfair. After Henry's apprenticeship, he became a partner in the business in 1867, but it wasn't until 1876 that the firm changed its name to Holland & Holland. While they already had a strong reputation for building fine rifles, the company gambled in 1883 and took part in the London trials. They concentrated on rifle making and they entered every class and took every prize from rook rifle to the mammoth four bore rifle. And their gamble paid off and <clears throat> um, it was well worth it since they had more to lose by reputation than those less known entrants. In 1899, the firm's name became Holland & Holland Limited. By this time, the company had reached the pinnacle of gun makers for building rifles for hunters of big and dangerous game. In 1912, they developed the most famous cartridge ever devised, the 375 belted rimless magnum, known mostly today simply as the 375 H and H magnum. The 375 offered very flat tra trajectory, adequate bullet weight, and outstanding performances in a handy bolt action rifle of top quality and it was the first belted case. <clears throat> According to Frank C. Barnes in his book, Cartridges of the World, and I'm quoting, this cartridge has been very successful and hence very popular in Africa, India, and of course, Alaska. Nearly every manufacturer in the world makes or has made rifles in belted versions of this cartridge, close quote. <clears throat> Jeffrey Boothroyd in his fine book, um, side locks and box locks wrote also, and I quote, the 375 H&H &H belted rimless Magnum Nitro Express was to become one of the all-around greats and could claim to have a greater degree of all-around worldwide acceptance than any other cartridge, particularly for African game. Today, the 375 H&H &H Magnum still holds its own and over 25 different cartridges employ the belted rimless case, close quote. In 1960, after residing at 98 New Bond Street for 100 years, the firm moved to 13 Bruton Street. 
and soon thereafter moved again to their present address of 33 Bruton Street in London. It was in the early 90s when I visited 33 Bruton Street, where Holland Holland resided at the time. I had a reason for going there. I had a Holland Holland double rifle, and um, I wanted to take the serial number and find out uh, what I could about the gun. Plus, I also needed a uh, screwdriver that was missing out of the case, ebony handled screwdriver. And uh, I had a business trip in London, so when I got there <clears throat> uh, and went to uh, 33 Bruton Street, I found uh, this familiar intercom button. They don't, all these gun makers keep their doors locked. Uh, you come in by appointment. <clears throat> and uh, so when they found out why I wanted to, why I was there, they buzzed me in. And what was different about Holland Holland from the others that I'd been to is that inside the first uh, area you come into, they had all these Holland Holland products that weren't guns displayed in nice, nice displays. I was met by a man by the name of Peter Chisman who took me up into the gun room where all these beautiful furniture style cabinets were around the room with uh, their guns standing up in it, lighted with glass doors, just very classy looking like you would expect Holland Holland to, to be. <clears throat> and uh, he immediately got someone going on the records to find what I wanted. And while he, they were doing that, and we, we talked and he, I told him about my gun books. He uh, sold me one of the, found, got the screwdriver for me, which they called turn screws. But uh, immediately it seemed they came back with a co photocopy of the old journal that the gun was featured in. The gun had been made in 1897 and it had been made for somebody named Lord Manners, whoever, whoever that was. And it was 450, 400 by 2 and 3 eighths and had some other details. But uh, uh, as soon as uh, I was about to leave, uh, Peter said he thought they had a copy of my book downstairs in their gun library and asked me if I would come down and sign it. And when I consented, uh, then he asked to see my passport. So, Do you it, still have that rifle today? No, unfortunately... Uh, Sadly, I don't have it any longer. However, it would not have served our purpose here today. I wanted to show a uh, Holland Holland classic Mauser with a, they're in their three, world renowned 375 H&H cartridge. This is a combination that has become a classic icon in the world of uh, sporting arms. We have here today just such a rifle, and it's not merely their uh, sporting version called uh, the Bolt Action Magazine Rifle. It is the upgrade model deluxe takedown. And uh, H&H &H spells the model name with the French spelling three words. M I'm not sure how you pronounce it. M-O-D-E-L-E. -E, and then the second word is D-E. And the last word is L-U-X-E. This one has 24 and a half inch tapered barrels. Now let's relocate to the sideboard and examine uh, the rifle broken down into its major components in its case. Here we have the Model Deluxe takedown rifle disassembled in its finely crafted leather case with all the accessories. The case is lined with burgundy colored English wool and compartmentalized for the various components, the barrel action, the stock with the bottom metal, the scope, and accessories. One compartment has a lid with a brass knob Accessories include a two-piece brass cleaning rod and a pouch with miscellaneous brushes. The case has two labels, one on the inside of the lid, a black label with gold writing, and a second one on the outside of the top of the trunk, a brass label with black writing. Both labels read Holland & Holland, 13 Bruton Street, London, W1. The inner label also reads Established, 1835. It is important to note that Holland & Holland resided at 13 Bruton Street for only a short time, and that both labels and the inscription on their rifle identify that address, not their current address at 33 Bruton Street, nor their longtime <clears throat> former address, 98 New Bond Street. Now let's look at the disassembled uh, components individually. I'm going to pick up the barrel action. The action is a commercial Orbendorf Mauser action with a special Holland Holland bolt handle. I'll show you in a minute. The receiver has 
uh, still has the loading port cut out on the left side, although the H&H &H front scope block is halfway covering an inscription, we can make it out E-R-D-O-R-F, telling us that the inscription is Orbendorf for Orbendorf Mauser. It has the typical Mauser bolt release, uh, which requires pulling out the front end of the spring-loaded latch to remove the bolt. Looking at the inside of the action behind the bolt release, uh, we see the ejector, which I don't think you can see in this video at this point. When it's an English rifle made with a Mauser action, you usually find two serial numbers, both Mausers and in this case Holland and Hollands. And we do. On the left side of the front receiver ring, uh, Mauser's number 106484. And on the underside of the receiver, in the flat under the chamber, H&H uh, is serial number 3585. A closer look at the Mauser serial number reveals three proof marks. The German proof mark crown C, uh, G since 1950, the London proof mark since 1637, and another one a crown B that I could not identify. Now looking at the bottom of the receiver again, notice the threaded hole <clears throat> in the recoil block for the takedown screw. You might remember from my first episode, Winchester improved the Mauser action for their Model 70. And one of the ways was that they removed, they uh, left this recoil block undrilled and moved the hole to the rear receiver flat behind the recoil block, discovering that it improved accuracy. On the right side of the receiver and barrel, uh, there are no markings only the word England stamped on the trigger housing. And we can see the single stage trigger is adjustable with a set screw and we can see the thumb safety assembly, uh, which is a second safety on this rifle. Back to our barreled action here, we see the H&H &H serial number again on the underside of the chamber of the barrel, along with some other numbers and initials that I'm assuming have to do with the tradesmen and inspectors. These are not proof marks. The proof marks are shown on the left side of the barrel chamber where we see the arm and saber over NP, which is the definitive London proof mark since 1904. Beside it are the proof numbers, which read 375, 2.85, and 19 tons, representing the standard proof load for the 375 H&H &H Magnum. Magazine holds four rounds. <clears throat> Receiver is fitted with two uh, scope blocks that are Holland & Holland's proprietary system for a quick detachable scope mounting system. We'll look at how this functions when we assemble the rifle and scope. As to the attached parts here, <clears throat> the barrel has an integral swell or boss for the mounting of the rear sight, which is a popular express sight with two leaves, one fixed, regulated for the proprietary ammo with a 270 grain bullet marked 270 and one folding regulated for their ammo with 360 grain bullet and so marked. Both are set for 100 yards. Also halfway down the barrel is a barrel band or collar uh, for the front sling swivel. And then lastly at the muzzle is another band or collar supporting the front sight mounted on a ramp with a hood or cover um, that can be laid down as it is right now, or there's a button release to raise it up, and it's controlled by pressing a spring-loaded button. The hood locks into place in either position. Now we'll set down the barrel to action. And uh, pick up the bolt assembly. First thing I notice is that it has the old Mauser style bolt sleeve with the old uh, military style safety. This uh, safety is a good one but hard to manipulate on, with a scope which explains why we have a second thumb safety mounted on the receiver. Bolt handle has a nice contour cutaway to provide clearance for the scope. We see the familiar long 98 Mauser extractor 
which is the basic design element <coughs> that makes the Mauser 98 a controlled feed mechanism. Also, there are the familiar Mauser locking lugs, two at the front of the bolt handle, with a third safety lug located at the rear, just forward of the bolt. <coughs> the bolt also has the Mauser guiding lug for aligning with the channel in the top of the rear receiver bridge. Across from the extractor, you see the little cutout for the, the locking lug for the ejector to fit through. And on the bolt face, you can see the firing pin hole and on the underside, two gas escape holes. The exposed part of the firing pin behind the bolt sleeve is in the white, as is the extractor. All the other parts are blue. Set the bolt down. Pick up the uh, <coughs> stock and uh, under metal part. Looking inside the barrel channel, we see clearly the fiddleback green of the English walnut, which carries through the entire length of the stock. Inscribed in the barrel channel is the serial number again, 3585. <clears throat> also sticking out of the stock is the magazine follower and the magazine spring that have to be aligned into the action's magazine well of the barrel action when we uh, reassemble it. Notice that there is a metal piece at the rear, at, <clears throat> it's a wear point at the upper, uh, for the upper tang. This part of the upper tang of the action actually clips over the matching piece of the tang on the action uh, for the rifle's uh, takedown feature. The front action screw has a metal sleeve, and while we have the stock off, we can see a case colored crossbolt going through the stock to reinforce the wood during recoil. Next, Let's look at the shape of the stock. This is not a classic comb. This one has a Monte Carlo. It's intended to be used with telescopic sights, which had become commonplace by 1970 when this rifle was built. And for that same reason, the FN sliding uh, style, sliding thumb safety as a second safety was added <coughs> for the telescopic sight use. Holland Holland's version of a Monte Carlo comb is one of the more handsome Monte Carlos. There are some ugly ones out there. On this one, the heel of the Monte Carlo curves down and around a very well-proportioned cheek piece that has a very tasteful sculptured uh, shadow line. The comb is not fluted, uh, but carved to a smooth point, yet not too fragile. The pistol grip curve is proportionally correct for this stock, and because of the size of the magazine, the stock is dropped down for the magazine, but even in the, this is carved nicely, tying into the pistol grip shape. On the left side of the stock, there are two receiver notches, uh, one for the bolt release and one for the finger channel uh, matching to the loading port cut in the receiver's left side. On the right side of the stock, there are three carved notches and one for the sliding safety here, one for the bolt handle, and a third one for the loading access to the magazine well. Here we have the major components of the takedown rifle disassembled on the table in front of us. I'm going to demonstrate putting it together. First I'll pick up the stock. This is, you have to watch the magazine follower and spring that's popped up here. Uh, is unusual for some takedown situations. The barrel action goes in with the tang underneath the little piece of uh, tang that's left in the stock <clears throat> permanently for for this uh, reload, I mean, uh, takedown feature. Then you have to line the magazine spring and the barrel just falls into place. Then you turn the uh, front action screw and it's got a large slot so it can easily be turned with a quarter or a large screwdriver. Turn screw, as English call it. <clears throat> and you turn the slot until it's uh, aligned with the rear uh, action screw. Insert the bolt. The bolt just passes through the, uh, the bolt release lever, just releases it for it. When you insert the, uh, <clears throat> on the Holland Holland quick detachable rings, you put the, uh, 
scope in at 45 degrees to the stock and putting that back ring in first, then the front ring, move the little lever forward till the knob is forward and it is in zero, back to zero. And it's fully assembled. I brought this beautiful Holland, Holland rifle to the range to find out if the rear sight is regulated uh, with, the, uh, with the rounds, with the numbers on the rear sight. And as you can see, the scope has been removed. Not bad. Ah, it's sighted in. Looks sighted in to me. Uh, now let's look at the exterior of the stock. <clears throat> First the wood. The color and figure of this wood give away that the rifle um, is an upgrade. The model Deluxe is, was named by Holland Holland in 1970. Today, it's their promotional materials call it the best quality magazine rifle. This is uh, English Walnut from one of the finest blanks uh, with near exhibition figure. This figure shows both dark streaks and fiddleback. Uh, for the names of the grain that run the full length of the stock. And it shows on both profiles and on the underside. Uh, the forend tip features genuine horn, and this one identifies its material better than most with the uh, natural white streaks in the right side. I really like that. Solid black tips are usually ebony on high-end rifles and more often Bakelite or some other man-made imitation of ebony on uh, many lesser quality guns, such as the case of the old uh, Winchester Model 70 Supergrade and most of the Ruger Model 77s. And solid black horn often looks the same as ebony, or it looks like the faux ebony lookalikes. But there is no doubt what this material is with the white streaks, it gives it away that the fact that it's genuine horn and to me, it looks stunning left in its natural state. Looking at the inlays, there's a gold oval uh, on the toe line. It's vacant here. It's ready for uh, owner's initials. The pistol grip has a case-colored um, grip cap. The original, uh, it's called a trap door grip cap because it opens. The original purpose of this is for carrying uh, extra front sight. I'll open that up. Carrying an extra front sight. This one's empty. And while I have it like this, you can see some of the nice engraving we'll be talking about in a minute. Uh, just behind the four-end checkering pattern is a case-colored cross bolt. While we're talking about the metal. It's needed to absorb um, recoil and prevent stock from splitting, uh, especially for this heavy caliber. About two inches from the toe on the toe line uh, is the rear sling swivel. And a comment about these sling swivels. Well, we see the common practice of installing sw swivel eyes uh, on most English guns. Holland, Holland, <coughs> excuse me, here has mounted true high-grade sling swivels. They are made with stops. The front one won't clink uh, into the surrounding metal and the, <clears throat> the rear one won't dig into the stock. However, they are set up for the European sling, which is only a 7 8 inch wide, not the typical 1 inch wide sling we usually see in this country. Finally, the butt is fitted with a leather-covered recoil pads, 3 quarter inch, it's dyed dark brown, which goes perfectly with the overall color of the stock. Um, with the pad, the length of pull is 13 and 5 eighths inch. It's about 1 inch and eighth inch longer than the Winchester Pre-64 Model 70 and 375. And the weight of this rifle with the scope is 9 pounds 4 ounces. Now looking at the hand checkering, 
on the grip, there are two panels of uh, point pattern checkering, and these have the re reverse curve made famous by Holland Holland. The two panels uh, come together over the wrist at a point. On the forend, the checkering is four point pattern, starting from the receiver and it runs forward to and abuts the horn uh, with a complete wrap around and it's very generous, uh, has 22 lines per inch and it's executed uh, with a combination of two lines of uh, border in the classic style. The checkering itself is extremely well executed. Um, the stock is finished with Holland Holland's hand polished French oil. This is one beautiful rifle. And I could, couldn't agree more. Um, and now if you look at the metal engraving, which only adds to the beauty of this gun, uh, the steel floor plate, which will have some close-ups of that, and trigger guard, our full coverage engraving. That's hand engraving, of course. It includes a uh, floor plate. Includes a special scroll banner. You can't see here. You'll see it in the close-ups. Uh, with the three French words "Model de Lux," however you say that, describing uh, the name of the, this model. The serial number three five eight five is on the bottom of the trigger and, or the trigger guard, it's surrounded with uh, scroll engraving. Both action screws are engraved and indexed. The color case hardened pistol grip cap is fully engraved as well. <clears throat> the three, excuse me, this, the receiver has scroll engraving on the side of the right rear bridge on both sides of the front ring up to the matted top panel on the left uh, and top the top of the rear receiver ring as viewed from the left and on the left sides of both scope ring bases. Interestingly enough, the top of the rear scope ring is engraved Holland and Holland over a stylized sunset and under that a serial number on the ring, 3585, so the rings are made with the rifle. There is one more inscription on the barrel Holland and Holland, 13 Bruton Street, London. The scope is uh, an Austrian-made Carl Kalis, two to seven variable with 36 uh, objective lens, and has the Kalis lens covers. And of course, the mounts and rings are the Holland and Holland proprietary quick detachable system. So looking at gun overall, we can easily see this model is the best quality model because of several noticeable features. The rich figure of the wood, the horn tip, and the heavy coverage of the engraving. Those are the most notable reasons. Something I didn't point out is notice the bolt handle is straight down. Instead of slanted back, this is the Mauser fashion preferred by professional hunters. Overall, this rifle to me is the classiest of all Mausers. I rarely uh, cover values and prices in these episodes, but since Holland Holland is still alive and well, <clears throat> I called my friend David Cruz at uh, Holland Holland's New York gallery, gun room. Um, this was in the summer of 2015. And here's the way the pricing stacked up. If a buyer purchased a bespoke, which is what they call it, H&H best quality magazine rifle at that time, for the uh, base price of the best quality magazine rifle, 29,500 pounds. If they wanted 375 H&H caliber, you had um, 1,750 pounds. For deluxe wood like this one, you add 1,250 pounds. For the takedown feature, you add 2,700 pounds. For the H&H scope rings, another 750 pounds and this scope is uh, about 1,500 pounds. For the deluxe model full coverage engraving, like this gun, it's 5,000 pounds for a total of 42,450 pounds. You convert that to US dollars and it was like a whopping $65,627 in 2015.
You're kidding. <laughs> no. That costs more than my car. But uh, since the UK's pulled out of the European Union now, I'm not sure where that number is today. I have a sense uh, if I were to look it up, it would be it would even change before uh, this episode airs anyway. That's it for today. Thank you, Virginia. And thank you, viewers, for watching. And if you enjoyed this episode, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and share with others. And I hope you join us next week for another episode of Special Guns with Roger Rule. We will be looking at what, he, what many believe is the best box lock over and under shotgun of all time. If you want to get involved with these types of guns, I recommend GunsInternational.com. The owners are great people. I know them and have been using their website since they started. I find it the best source for both buying and selling any great collectible gun.